Hello, Bible students. Welcome to session three of our study of the Gospel of John. Uh, we're under very unusual circumstances today because the Amenity Center is in use uh, on Wednesday night. That's tonight. And actually two weeks from tonight, it is also in use, which means that we will be, be meeting on Monday of that week. But next week, next Wednesday, we're back in uh, Ballroom E of the Amenity Center. So just plan on that. I hardly know what I'm doing in a format like this, but I'm under the capable directionship of Paula Clip. This is her first video to direct individually. She has been in charge in the, uh, in the ballroom, of course, and muted me both times, but assures me this time there is no muting going on, and I can only go from her word on that, so I will. Last week, we looked at what I consider to be perhaps the most important verse in all of the Bible. It's John 1 and verse 14. The Word became rather flesh and lived for a while among us. The Word became flesh. The fancy theological word for that, of course, is the incarnation. And we talked about the fact that this was not just something that Jesus did for 33 years of his life. No, the change that took place in Christ at the incarnation was a permanent change. The Godhead has developed an aspect of humanity to it because of what Jesus did when he decided to come to this earth and be born into it. Now, I think there are two things that I planned to say last week in connection with that. I think they're in the notes, but I didn't get around to saying them, and I felt bad about that when I got home. But here they are. Number one, we don't have to wonder about what God is like. Jesus is God in the flesh. If Jesus is someone who has compassion on the poor, God has compassion for the poor. If Jesus is someone who reaches out to people in their need, God is someone who does the same thing. We don't have to wonder about the character and the thoughts and the nature of God. It is seen clearly in Jesus because the Word became flesh. The second thing that I wanted to mention, and I think this is at least equally important, is what we have to look forward to. Um, there are two passages, passages of Scripture that I meant to read last week, but I will do them now. One is from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. I actually memorized this a few years ago. I'll try it. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring all things together, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus is going to use the power of the universe to change us, and he is going to change us into what he is a glorified body. Now, there are a lot of mornings I wake up and I can't imagine this body could ever be glorified again, but the promise of Scripture is that that's exactly what Jesus is going to do. And in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Hmm, bit of a mystery as to what we will be. But John goes on to say, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. John assures us no one has ever seen God. God cannot be seen. But Jesus, because he became like us, has made it possible for us to become like him. And all of that is tied to the words the Word became flesh. And I don't want us to ever forget that. You know, it occurs to me, I don't have to mention this, but I will. 
When I was a teenager, I remember the kinds of sermons I heard. I heard a lot of sermons about the evils of, uh, of uh, uh, drinking and, and gambling and smoking and, and going to the movies. Yes, going to the movies was a sin in Canada. We had a different Bible apparently, but anyway, it was, but there were all kinds, and I remember sermons about how important it was to be baptized. I even remember sermons about the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, but nobody ever told me about the incarnation. How could I have gone all those years and not understood that the word became flesh? It's powerful and it's necessary for us to remember that. So, the Lord now is about to begin his ministry, and he is going to do that by calling a small group of people around him. Uh, the number 12 probably has some significance since there were 12 tribes, although the New Testament never tells us that it's significant, but Jesus will eventually call 12 people, and he will form an inner circle with these 12 people, and he will mentor them. They will go with him. They will listen to him. They will watch him. And there will be opportunities for them to emulate him when he sends them out two by two to do in various villages and towns what they saw him doing. And he gives them the power to do that. It's a group that is mentored because the Lord knows when he comes to this earth, he won't be here that long. And he has come not only to save the world, he has come to change the world. And he is going to be counting on these 12 people and the ones that they influence to get that job done. It's a very, very important uh, ministry. His first followers come from the disciples of those who were initially followers of John. John the baptizer, as he's known in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see, John was that charismatic character. He was strange, we noticed, but he was charismatic. And there were disciples who said, I'm going to spend my time with you. I'm going to listen to what you say. But John always understood that his role was to point, to point to Jesus. And as soon as he had the opportunity, he would do exactly that. I'm reminded when my son, my firstborn son, Jonathan, was like one and a half years old. He couldn't even really talk yet, but he could point. <laughs> you know, he would see something unusual and he would point at it. The problem was he would see someone unusual and he would point. At, well, you know, we had to break him of that. But we don't want to break John of that because that's John's job. He is a pointer, and he points people to Jesus. So, um, one day John the Baptist was standing around with some of his followers, and here came Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John says as he points to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, that phrase is found only in John. It is not found in the synoptics. It will later be found in Revelation, but it's in none of the other Gospels, and it's an unusual term. We don't know specifically what John meant by that. Uh, some have pointed out, well, it's obviously the Passover lamb. Well, yes, it could have been. In Isaiah 53, there's this prophetic passage about Jesus and his terrible death that says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth but John has in mind an image that Jesus is the lamb of God more important than the image of him being the lamb is what he says that the lamb is going to do he will take away the sin of the world not the sins it's not a plural word. He's not talking about certain individual sins. Yes, we need to get rid of those. But John in this statement sees sin as a plague that has come upon this world because of our stupidity, because of our stubbornness, because of our unwillingness to bend to the will of God. And as a result, we're embroiled in this terrible dilemma called sin. 
Jesus is the one who takes away the sin of the world. There have been several... Uh, no, I'll go on from that. I don't want to spend any more time on that. John explains his ministry of baptizing people was to prepare people for the Lamb. Yes, he preached a, a baptism of repentance, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the Gospels tell us, but it was in preparation for the one who was going to come. It was getting ready for the Lamb. So, even though the Gospel of John does not directly uh, describe the baptism of Jesus, as do the other Gospels, at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke, yes, he does infer that the baptism took place. And John the baptizer tells us that God had told him that when you see the Spirit of God coming upon an individual and remaining on him, you will know that that is the Messiah. So, why did Jesus have to be baptized? Well, I've got a couple of things here that are possibilities for that that I thought I would read to you. I don't know that you need them, but I'm going to anyway. Possibility number one. Jesus was baptized in order to identify with those that he came to save. Here's the page I'm looking for. I think Paula moved it. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. <laughs> By submersion in the waters of the Jordan, Jesus is publicly seen as one who is in need of repentance and forgiveness himself, although he had no need of it in actuality. Jesus is already embracing the enormous weight of humanity's sinfulness just as he will do again in a definitive and final way on the cross. Labeled there as a criminal and a blasphemer, the mysterious events at the Jordan River already foreshadow the saving acts of Christ's death and resurrection. That's one possibility. Here's another one. Jesus was baptized in order to mark the official start of his ministry. Since John would be handling the ministry, excuse me, since John would be handing the ministry baton over to Jesus when Jesus was ready to begin the ministry, what better place to do it than in the Jordan River where John, for quite some time, had been helping people turn from their sin and prepare themselves for Jesus' coming? This possibility makes sense too. Possibility number three. Jesus was baptized in order to ceremonially cleanse him before being filled with the Holy Spirit. According to the Old Testament, the Jewish high priest was the only man authorized by God to enter the Holy of Holies, the most sacred room in the temple where God's Spirit dwelled. And before entering there, the high priest would always wash his hands as a part of a ceremonial cleansing. Maybe that's what Jesus was doing. It occurs to me also that this was a perfect opportunity for God to fulfill what he told John was going to happen. There would be somebody who the Spirit of God would come and remain upon. John said, that happened. In the Jordan River, after I had baptized this man, I saw the Spirit of God descend and remain on him. And the conclusion to which John comes is most important. He says in verse 34 of chapter 1, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Do you remember the purpose that we looked at in chapter 20? I write these things to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John says... I'm down with that. I saw what happened at the Jordan River. I heard what God told me, and I put two and two together, and I can tell you this is the Son of God. That's the conclusion that John wants all of us to reach as we go through his gospel. Now, um, oh, and, and, and concerning the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus, 
You know, there are several examples in the Old Testament of the Spirit of God coming upon certain individuals. They had a task, they had some mighty act to perform, and the Spirit empowered them, enabled them to do whatever it was that God wanted them to do, but then the Spirit left them. It wasn't a permanent gift. For Jesus, it remained. And it remained so that he could do incredible things during his ministry. He would heal the sick. He would, he would give health to the lame and the crippled. And he would even raise the dead. Because the Spirit of God had come upon him and empowered him to do all of those things. So, when Jesus, when John rather uh, repeats the statement about Jesus being the Lamb of God in, in the presence of two of his disciples, they left and followed him, but followed Jesus. Now, you've got to believe that John was preparing them for that. Guys, this is great. I'm glad you're here, but don't get stuck on me because you ain't staying with me. I've got someone else for you to follow. He's coming. And when he says, this is the Lamb of God, it is the most natural thing in the world for them to leave Jesus and to follow him. So, when Jesus turns and sees these two following him, he asks them, uh, well, it seems like a unique question. What do you want? The very first words that we hear of Jesus in the Gospel of John is, what do you want? And I don't want to make too much of this, but you know, it occurs to me that that's the question that Jesus asks every one of us. Really, what, what, what do you want? What is life about for you? Many people never answer that question. They never think that it is a question to be answered. But he asks each one of us, really, what do you want? And it's interesting to me that the two that are following Jesus don't really answer that question. They don't say, well, this is what I want. They said, where are you staying? <laughs> well, that's not an answer. But what it does suggest is that they think it's important that they have time to sit down and talk with Jesus about himself and his ministry and what he's looking for so that they will know what they want. And after that conversation, they will find out they want Jesus. But they ask him, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. Now, we don't know exactly what house he went to on that occasion. But we know what time it was when he went there with the two. It was about, John says, the tenth hour. Now, the tenth hour in our reckoning is ten o'clock in the morning. And it's possible that John the Apostle was using Roman time when he said that. It's possible, but it's unlikely. When you see the times that John uses later on in describing the timing of the crucifixion, it is clear he is using Jewish time. And there's no reason to doubt that that's exactly what he's using here. So the 10th hour, beginning at 6 o'clock in the morning, would be 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they followed Jesus home. I envisioned them breaking bread together. I envisioned them reclining around a table and talking and talking and then deciding this is the man that we want to follow. Um, the conversation was convincing enough for one of them. By the way, one of them is given a name. There were two, John says. There were two. One of them is given a name right now, Andrew. And Andrew decided after that conversation, I need to tell Simon about this. Simon was his brother. And you know, there was always this messianic hope in Israel, but you know, there were many people who had long given up on the idea that God was somehow going to do something significant and amazing. But every conversation that Andrew had, he'd had it with his brother. And so he goes and he finds Simon and 
and he decides to bring him to Jesus, to tell him what he's learned about Jesus. By the way, in John's gospel, Andrew is always a fellow who is bringing people to Jesus. When the multitude was hungry and there wasn't enough food, somebody found a boy that had five small loaves and two fish. Do you remember who it was? It was Andrew. Andrew brought the boy to Jesus and said, will this do any good? And later on in John chapter 12, there are some Greeks who are visiting Jerusalem and they want to see Jesus. And Andrew brings them to Jesus. He's just a guy who brings folks to Jesus. And you know what? There are a lot worse descriptions you can have of people than the fact that they bring people to Jesus. So when Simon comes to Jesus, <laughs> he gets a new nickname. Oh, Simon. Yeah, that won't do. I'm going to call you Rocky. <laughs> Not Rocky Balboa. That's a different Rocky. <laughs> Okay, The Rock, if you like. I am going to call you Pete, <clears throat> excuse me, Cephas, which in Greek is Peter. And amazingly, that's kind of what he came to be known as. Now, I wasn't there. I'm old, but I wasn't there. I don't know if anybody else in the room snickered when he said, I'm going to call you The Rock, because if anybody was not a rock, it was Simon. He was impetuous. He was here and there. You never know what Peter was going to say or do. He wasn't, he wasn't dependable. He demonstrated that, by the way, later on when he denied his Lord three times. He was not yet the rock. But you know what? In the life of the early church, that's exactly what he became. He became the one that people could depend upon. He became the one who, when pressed about his faith, said, I believe in Jesus. Oh, you tell me I'm not supposed to preach? God tells me I should. Guess who I'm going to obey? So Peter becomes the rock. And that reminds me of a principle that's really throughout Scripture, but it's especially important in Jesus. Jesus is able to see not only what people are, and surely he saw Peter for what he is, but he sees them for what they can be. Some of you have heard me tell this kind of story, and I'll, I'll abbreviate it, but you know, when I was a teenager, there was something in me that drew me to the idea that I should, I should be a preacher or that I should be a teacher of God's Word. <laughs> I was not the kind of teenager that you would think that would want to do that. More than that, I was not the kind of teacher, the teenager that anybody else thought that I ought to be doing that. In fact, when I told my school counselor I was going to be a preacher, she thought I must be kidding. That just couldn't be possible. But I wasn't kidding. And this story goes hand in hand with that. My first efforts at preaching were anything but successful. In the first little church that I preached at, there was 30, 35 people that came on Sunday morning. I told you one of the leaders put his arm around me and said, we know that there's not much you can do for us, but maybe we can do something for you. <laughs> and boy, there was truth in that. I preached there for a couple of years. And the seed of the gift that God had given me began to blossom. I soon came to believe more and more that, yes, God not only saw me for what I was when I was a teenager, but what I could be. And I know there are countless stories of the Bible students in this class where that is true. God saw not only what you were when you came to him, but he saw what you could be. And some of you have made amazing improvement and growth in your life, in your Christian life, because you believed that God could do something with you. Well, he believed that about Simon, and so he renamed him Peter. Now, 
I said there were two disciples, and one of them was named Andrew. What was the other one's name? Well, I can't guarantee it, but most of the time, the unnamed disciple in John's gospel is none other than John himself. In fact, let me read verse 41 to you, because it, it could read in two different ways. It says, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon. Now that verse could be translated, and it would be accurate. The first to find his brother was Andrew. Maybe inferring that the second to find his brother was John, the other unnamed disciple, and you all know who his brother is, right? James. James and John, the sons of thunder. So, I believe that since there were two disciples, one of them is named Andrew, one of them goes unnamed, in all likelihood, the unnamed one was John. Now, then Jesus left Judea and he headed to more familiar territory, Galilee, the area in which he grew up, the area in which his family lived, the area in which he had made friends. And then John writes something that's contrasted with the other ones. You know, they found Jesus in a way, but it says here that Jesus found Philip and asked him to be a follower. Now, maybe I shouldn't say this, but Philip is the guy in the New Testament that always looks like he's a little slow on the uptake. I, I, I hope that's not inaccurate, okay? Not all bulbs shine as brightly as the others. So, like for instance, remember I told you that Andrew brought the Greeks to Jesus because they were seeking him? Well, they went to Philip first and said, we want to see Jesus. And Philip went, uh, I don't know. Yeah. And, and he went to Andrew and said, what should we do? And this is not in the text, but it's inferred. Andrew said, well, I've got an idea. Why don't we take them to see Jesus? Philip didn't think of that. And the worst one of all, the worst one of all, we'll see it in detail in chapter 12, is when Jesus is spending that emotional time with his disciples. And he says, you know, now that I've been with you all this time, you understand what the Father is like. You know, you don't have to wonder about that anymore. And Philip says, would you please show us the Father? And, and if ever there was an inferred eye roll in the New Testament, it's here. <laughs> Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you this long? And you now say, show us the Father. Do you not know that he who has seen me has seen the Father? Philip was a little slow on the uptake. If that's not true, I'll have an eternity to apologize to Philip. And I, I will spend half of it doing that anyway. So, Philip now decides, hey, I know someone who needs to meet Jesus. Philip becomes convinced of the claims of the Lord and what others say about him. So he goes and finds a fellow named Nathaniel. Now Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree and Philip said to him, come and see what I found. You wouldn't believe it. It's the guy that the prophet spoke about. It's the guy that we've been waiting for. And you know who it is? His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that spoiled it for Nathaniel. Nazareth. This is not in the Greek, but really? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Never mind the Messiah, for Pete's sake. Anything good. A guy who's good at making pants would be a blessing. Come and see. You see, that's what Jesus had said. Come and see. So now Philip says to Nathaniel, okay, you don't have to believe me. Come and see. And so 
Nathaniel and Philip start going toward Jesus, and while there's a little, while they're still a little way off, Jesus sees them coming, and he points at Nathaniel and said, "Now there's a special Israelite. He's a fellow in which there is no deceit. There's no guile. It's the word that's used to describe Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob, who tricked his brother out of the birthright. You remember that? He deceived him out of the birthright. Well, there's none of that." in this man. And Nathaniel rightly says, you don't know me. You don't know whether I have any guile in me or not. We've never even met. And Jesus says, and this is cryptic at least, before Philip even called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, what you'd like at this point is a paragraph explaining that. Nope, it's not in the gospel. But you know what? People can't stand to leave things alone. Let me just read to you something that I found in a book. A few interpretations of this passage. The first is to take it literally that Nathanael thought that Jesus had some kind of special spiritual ability to have seen him even though he was not there. Jesus also appears taken aback that this minor miracle is so impressive to Nathanael. Perhaps Nathanael's spiritual routine was to pray and meditate under a fig tree. Imagine if someone you never met told you he saw you doing something he was not present for. It would be shocking, and it would make a great impression upon you. Now, maybe this says more about me than the text, but I'm going to tell you. The first time I became aware of this passage and Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, my first thought was, ooh, what was he doing? You know, that it was something bad. And that he was confronted about that by Jesus because after all, that's what God does. He confronts people about things they do wrong. But that doesn't make any sense. Jesus does not say, here comes a guy who shouldn't have been doing what he was doing under the fig tree. No, he says, here's a man there in, in which there's no deceit. He's, he's an amazing Israelite. So if Jesus brags on him, it would be ludicrous to think that there was something bad he was doing. A second understanding of this passage, don't write this off, is that under the fig tree was an expression. The fig tree was symbolically connected to the coming messianic era. Did you hear that? The fig tree was associated symbolically with the coming messianic era. And I happen to turn this other Bible here to Micah chapter 4 and verse 4 because they gave that as a reference. So I wanted to see if that really made sense. Here's what it says. In talking about, by the way, the chapter is entitled The Mountain of the Lord and, and talks about what's going to take place in the last days. Now listen to this. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree. And no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And based on Micah's prophecy and perhaps other things, it became an expression among the Jews that when things were good, Every man had his own vine, and every man had his own fig tree to sit under. And that became symbolic of the Messianic age when God was going to make everything good. So, Philip had gone to Nathanael to tell him he had found the Messiah. Why did he run to tell Nathanael this? Perhaps it was because Nathanael was eagerly awaiting the Messiah. When Jesus says he saw him under the fig tree, he is saying that he knows Nathanael has been waiting for the day he would encounter the Messiah. Nathanael realizes that Jesus has seen into the innermost longings, and he takes this as a divine sign. I don't know. I do know that it makes 
made quite an impression on Nathaniel because he concluded, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. I saw you under the fig tree before Nathaniel called you. Philip called you, rather. You are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Something significant happened in his heart. And by the way, I should mention this. You Bible students already know this. I asked Paula if she knew this, and she came through with flying colors, of course, which you would expect. <laughs> oh, yes, we do, we do need a chuckle there, Paula. Do you know that Nathaniel is never mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke? Not even when they list the 12 apostles. No Nathaniel. There is, however, a Bartholomew. And Bartholomew always follows Philip in the list of the apostles. Philip and Bartholomew. Because Philip found Bartholomew, who was also called Nathaniel. Can people really have two names? Are you not are you not familiar with Larry Bob? I mean, in Texas, <laughs> it is not unusual for people to have two names. And apparently, this man did. Why John decides to call him Nathaniel while the other gospels call him Bartholomew is a question you'll have to ask John when you get the opportunity to do that. Now, oh, by the way, Jesus is a little surprised at Nathaniel's response, but you're the son of God. He said, really? You get that from, from me seeing you under the fig tree? Well, let me tell you what. You'll see more than that, Nathaniel. You will see the heavens opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's what you'll see. Now, for those who have an Old Testament background, you, you have to think back to the dream that Jacob had while he was traveling. He laid down for the night and he had this weird dream, something he ate or something that God decided to get across to him. But he saw the heavens open and he saw the angels ascending and descending. And, and when he woke up, he said, I'm naming this place Bethel, 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 the house of God. He saw that as the presence of God with him, with the angels descending. And I think that Jesus is saying, you are going to see the power of God come upon me and me distribute that to others like you've never seen before. This thing of me seeing you under the fig tree is no big deal. But there are big deals coming, and you better be ready. The signs that Jesus will do will be a bridge between heaven and earth as God's power is, is poured out upon all people. Now, I'm just about ready to close the lesson. I don't have any idea how long it's lasted, Paula, but as the director, I'm sure you know. 38 minutes and 30. Nine seconds. Well, our timekeeper, Paul, <laughs> our timekeeper, Paul, will appreciate that we are going to be finishing early. I want to say a few words about witnessing. Now, that's a word that makes a lot of people nervous. Someone says, I think I'll go witness to him, and they go, oh, no. No. Here's something I want you to understand. We don't say it this way. But somebody witnessed to us once. Somebody told us or showed us their faith. For me, it was primarily my mother. My father at that time never went to church. My brothers basically had moved out of the house. I was the baby of the family. I know that comes as a shock. And my mother witnessed to me 
Every time she took communion sitting beside me, every time she sang the hymns of faith and taught me how to sing the hymns of faith, she was witnessing to me. The Bible teachers that I had while I was growing up, I can still remember many of them. Poor Marvin Johnson in the fourth grade, I gave him fits. But he stuck with me. And he witnessed to me about what the Bible said and about his belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And I don't know that I've ever told you this story, but there was a single lady in our church when I was about 14 or 15 years old, something like that. I'm going to guess she was in her late 40s, just a guess. Everybody looks old when you're 14. She may have only been 35. But anyway, she walked up to me one day after church and said, I know this is a little unusual, but I want to tell you, I believe you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I admit that I had kind of thought about it before that, but once Muriel witnessed to me about her belief in me, it became more of a realistic goal. And here's the thing. We now have, I'll say many, opportunities to witness to others. About two weeks ago, I take people to the airport, and as a result of doing that, I get a chance to talk to people about where they're going and why. And this lady said to me, I'm going to Colorado to witness to my friend one more time. Someone that she had tried to show the path of Jesus to her before, but had never been successful, I am going to witness to her again. And I think that's one of the best ways in the world to reach people. To say, hey, let's, let's study the New Testament. I, hey, nobody believes in Bible study any more than I do. But you want to be effective in other people's lives? Witness. Tell them about what the Lord has done for you. Tell them about what Jesus means to you. Philip says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. He's from Na I know, I know. You have a bias against Nazareth, but just come and see. And that's what we can say to people. You have doubts? I don't know. Come and see. Give people that opportunity. Because someone has witnessed to you on your journey of faith. You can be a witness to others. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Paula's done a great job of directing. She didn't chuckle as much as, you know, as I, 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 it's probably because I couldn't kick her under the desk. But anyway, God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday.